All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. Um, so I have, I think, received all the exams uh, via Canvas. So once I confirm that I've received all those exams, I will post the solutions and you'll see those. And uh, so grading will happen in the next couple of days. Lab four is in progress and you'll start lab five this week. So it's really great to see that data coming in. I, I'm, I'm liking comparing um, my data to your data and seeing differences across the um, uh, across the different data sets. So what's going to be exciting is when we start enabling your project with internet connectivity, um, we're going to be able to collect all the data, aggregate it, and do some comparisons. I hope to get all that done um, once we once we start uh, connecting projects to the network. Um, so the last class. We finished up primary batteries and we started rechargeable batteries. We're gonna continue and finish that up today. Talk about a little bit of solar and then move on to power control topics. So we'll finally talk about the MOSFET that you're using uh, in your lab project and uh, some details on that. All right. So last time, we left off talking about rechargeable batteries and I mentioned these types here. Uh, we went through lead acid batteries. Um, these are the heavy batteries in your car, uh, but they're cheap and they work and your car doesn't require a light battery or an expensive battery. So that's why we use them there. Nickel metal hydride was big. Um, that must've been about 20 years ago in cell phones. I don't think cell phones use those anymore. They've moved on to lithium ion batteries that have um, higher energy density, more capacity. And so lithium ion batteries now you find in uh, power tools, cordless power tools like drills. Um, you find them in devices like, uh, you know, phones. Um, you can buy, you can buy different um, battery formats, lithium ion power projects with them. But they're, they're really known for high energy density, for high energy capacity, they're generally pretty high cost uh, compared to other batteries, and but they do hold charge over time. And then move over to lithium polymer. So lithium polymer batteries, you know, there's always this distinction, lithium ion versus lithium polymer. But what you'll find is really lithium polymer is um, a, a battery of lithium ion technology, but it has a, uh, a gel, a polymer gel electrolyte in it versus a, a liquid electrolyte. So you can make them into these low profile shapes um, compared to these other batteries um, that are lithium ion. The, these batteries here, the lithium ion, I want to go back to those. You'll see these double A looking batteries that are bigger, larger in, in uh, diameter in length compared to double A batteries. They look like double A batteries, but they're just packaged in a similar way. Um, they're usually these 18650 um, that actually includes the dimensions encoded in 18650. And uh, you, those actually you can put together, I'll show you, you, you can make bigger batteries out of those. Um, a lot of electric bike batteries, electric scooter batteries, even Tesla batteries are made up of, some of the Tesla batteries are make, made up of these 18650s. Um, in those cells built up into larger batteries. In low profile devices, you'll find uh, lithium polymer batteries that again, they can be made low profile. Um, they're, they're generally a little, I'll say a little more fragile than the lithium ions because they're, they're these pouch batteries that are kind of squishy. And so um, that's, that scares me a little bit. You don't want to be puncturing these and they can also they can also bulge, um, so you got to you got to be careful because of the high energy density with lithium ion lithium polymer. They're definitely um, riskier in recharging compared to especially lead acid. Lead acid you can connect about any voltage up to about fifteen maybe sixteen volts and charge a lead acid battery. Um, but lithium polymers don't like to be overcharged and they can actually um, outgas, they can catch fire. So you gotta be careful with those. Uh, there's lithium iron phosphate batteries. These are getting known for DC power packs and high energy backups. Um, they're, 
in the lithium family. So they're in this lithium 3.6 volt ish per cell, the you know, three to 3.6. And they are higher cost compared to lithium ion, um, but they're, they're getting more popular. Um, you know, you might wonder why, why didn't we take these lithium ion batteries, make them in a double A dimension, double A form factor and use those in our devices for rechargeable batteries. It's, it's because of that three volts per cell, right? One double uh, A batteries are 1.5 volts per cell. When we have the non-rechargeable lithiums, those are the uh, lithium iron disulfide batteries. They're not rechargeable, but anyway, that's why we don't just take these, make them smaller and plug them into double A devices. You'd burn out your devices with that higher voltage. Okay, so generally these lithium ion, lithium polymer batteries, I mentioned higher risks during charging. Also during discharging, they have such a high current capability. You can get those in 10, 15 plus amps, um, a, a current rating, that's a lot of current. And if you actually exceed their current rating, if they don't have protection built in, you can, you can heat those up and cause a fire. The popularity of the lithium iron phosphate batteries is they're generally considered um, safer than lithium polymer, although you can still do damage with high current output. Um, they, they claim to be um, incombustible and uh, lower thermal risk. So we'll see how time plays out for those. And then the nickel metal hydride, they're generally considered safe, but uh, they release hydrogen if overcharged. And so that, that could be a problem, but they are definitely lower uh, energy capacity. So those are the ranges. That's the range of rechargeable batteries you'll see in, in devices. I'm sure there are more out there, but these are the popular ones. So, okay, so someone asks, so does LiPo have a, have a current risk or is it the lithium iron phosphate? Um, both, both do, both can produce very high currents. So if you short those batteries, you, you can easily start a fire with a, with a wire. You can heat up a wire and make it glow with that kind of current capacity. Um, the, many of the lithium ion batteries, and you got to check, you got to check for the specific model and manufacturer. Many of those have built-in circuits that will, uh, limit charging and limit current and those are the more expensive batteries. And so they have some protection built in. Some are completely unprotected. So those are really a higher current risk, higher, you know, during ch charge and discharge, you can cause problems there. The, the lithium iron phosphate, I think that the benefit of those is that the, the materials aren't combustible or as combustible as the lithium ion type batteries. So, but again, we'll see how that plays out. I've been looking for a lot of information on these. I'm more interested in the, the lithium iron phosphate batteries for when you, when you're in your car or you're in some place that um, where you have a lot of energy attached to some kind of device and you don't want it to, you know, go into some thermal runaway. Uh, so I, I'm leaning toward those as being safer now. So, so lots of research to do on those still. Okay. So. But then again, all batteries have risk of causing a fire uh, when shorted. So you, you could take a double A battery and you can light up steel wool, a nine volt battery, light up steel wool. You'll see that thin conductors will glow, will um, could cause a fire when shorted. So you gotta be careful. And then you'd look at taking uh, batteries, those batteries and putting them into high energy battery packs, right? So this is that Tesla battery uh, this looks like an aftermarket Tesla battery that I mentioned. But in general, here's some guidance and takeaways that I'd like to point out um, about batteries that, that we talked about over the last couple of days. So I showed a lot of AA battery data, but I think if you look at those slides, you'll see you can find that data for different battery types, for rechargeable batteries. Um, so you can use what you learned here to other batteries. I hope to point out, I, hoped, I hope I did point out that battery performance is nonlinear and it depends on many factors, including temperature, and that you can start with that manufacturer data 
and then use it for determining kind of you know approximate performance relative performance of different battery types so if you have an application you need either a light battery or high capacity or cheap or you know low volume or you don't care about volume right you can you can go in and choose based on manufacturer data and compare batteries but the battery performance is definitely nonlinear so when you buy a battery you go into you go into the store and you see 1500 milliamp hours versus 1800 milliamp hours well it depends on the chemistry right and um, it depends how you're going to use it so i hope to have pointed that out and always test right if you're building something um, you're testing a prototype then you know run a few batteries into the dirt and uh, make sure that you understand the performance based on your product's power and, and current requirement. All right, so here's some details on this really neat battery. Uh, this is a battery module for a Model S and a Model X. And so it's got a capacity of 5.3 kilowatt hours, right? These are individual um, 18650 cells. So there's little double A, but a little bigger looking cells. Those are stacked up in here in series and parallel. 55 pounds of those, including the case. Um, there's the energy density. Sometimes you'll see configurations of, of cells designated like this. So the 74P6S, it means it's, it's 74 cells in parallel and six of those in series. Remember from that battery diagram, I said you can combine batteries in parallel and series. So that designates the parallel and series combination. So this is 444 of those 18650 cells. And if you work out the parallel and series combinations, right, you get 3.8 volts per cell. Um, six in series gives you 22.8 volts there. So it's a 22 volt battery. So it's pretty safe, right? When you get over 50 volts, voltage starts becoming dangerous because it'll start conducting more current through you if you touch the terminals. So this is pretty safe, but it has a lot of energy capacity. So there's where the there's where the risk comes in. All right. So so that's the summary, kind of the the quick roll through on batteries to get you up to speed on those. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, uh, power power sources, power control, actually power uh, solar power sources and power control, and so. Um, Solar panels, right? Obviously, they're used on houses. They're used in solar farms to provide energy to the grid. Um, you can also use them for, you know, taking your camper off grid. For if you have a ranch, uh, your ranch gate can be powered by solar panel and a battery, or any device like street signs. Now you'll see solar panels powering the flashing pedestrian lights when you hit the button. So lots of applications for small solar systems okay so let's just talk briefly about some solar panel basics we'll talk about some terminology kind of how they work but more concentrate on how do you know how many panels do you need how, what, what kind of data is out there for um for solar and determining what kind of capacity you could get out of a certain area okay so let's talk terminology so a solar array is, an, is many solar panels. This is one solar panel and one solar panel consists of individual uh, solar cells or photovoltaic PV cells. And so those PV cells, photovoltaic cells convert light energy into electric energy um, based on the photovoltaic effect. And it's really kind of neat because that's, if you think about it, one of the few primary energy sources where we go from from you know one prime one, one energy source like like the sun and directly convert it into electrical energy right other sources of energy like um you know petroleum or um uh what else nuclear um uh, coal like we we burn it and we usually heat water and we we boil the water, we create steam, we turn something and that some that turns a generator and that generator generates electricity, right? There's a, there's lots of stages in between. I call that, I call that burn and turn, right? We're, we're burning something and then we're turning a, um, 
uh, a generator. Photovoltaic is kind of neat um, because it, it goes right from the sun's energy, photons, and converts it right into um, electrical energy. So it's it's neat. Uh, but there are, there, there are pluses and there are, are minuses to it compared to other forms. So PV cells are this. So just to dig into a little bit of um, little of what's going on behind the scenes here, the photovoltaic cells, they're an N-type semiconductor right, material over a P-type semiconductor uh, forming a PN junction. And if you took my class, my last class on electronics, right, that should sound a lot like a diode. And it actually is, it, it is like a diode. It's, um, it's like a photodiode, especially where you expose the junction to light and you can cause current to flow. So light or photons uh, enters the, the PN junction through that thin N layer and transfers the photons, transfer energy to um, the, the atoms and excite the electrons and cause what's called a photo-induced electric current. And then the current flows externally through whatever you have connected to it. Okay, so that's the energy transfer um, through the photovoltaic effect. Okay, light energy, photons, causing electrons to flow. So stepping up a level, let's talk about uh, solar panel power conversion and relate that to power efficiency. So solar power, solar power comes from the sun and there's a convenient number to know and that's called peak sun. So what kind of energy do we get? What's the power density on the earth typically in full sun when you're perpendicular to the sun? Um, that's called solar irradiance and it's about a kilowatt. It's 1000 watts per square meter. That's why I mean it's a convenient number. It's an easy number to remember. So at the Earth's surface on a clear day um, at noon, um, one square meter perpendicular to the sun, so you capture all the energy in that square meter, um, it, it, roughly a kilowatt. Okay, so that's what we get. So we have the solar panel and you have a kilowatt for every square meter uh, hitting that solar panel. That's the energy available. Like you can't get any more than that. If you had a 100% efficient solar panel, you collect all of the sun's energy and you won't, um, all you could get is a thousand watts. That's, that's the energy available there. And so the typical solar cell efficiency is about 22%, uh, 22.6%, you'll see 22.8. Now, maximum, older solar panels were about 15%. So we've gotten better, but there's, there's kind of a, there's a limit we're hitting there for technical reasons. But the efficiency, and this will show up when we talk about power conversion too, efficiency is power out um, over power in. And in this case, solar cell efficiency is the, the power out that you're, you're getting, you're giving to your electric circuit divided by the power in from the sun. Okay, so that's, that's what that means here. So if you have a thousand watts available to you from the sun in a square meter and you connect some kind of load and you measure the, the voltage and you measure the current and you take that load and you tweak its impedance so that you get a maximum. Um, what you're going to see is you get uh, about 216 watts per meter squared. And that's, that's about all you're gonna get for, for solar panels these days. So every square meter, one meter by one meter, um, that you have, you're going to get about 216 watts full sun at noon perpendicular to the sun's rays. Okay, so so this particular this particular panel, um, you get about um, 400 watts, and the area is 1.85 meters squared. You can go to the data sheets and you can see this. Data sheets um, publish their areas, their efficiencies, and I found they're pretty consistent. So you can double check on, uh, you know, if they're giving the true efficiency number or the true power output. Okay. 
so that's that's a summary of you know the the available energy that's what you the available energy and power that you can get um from the area that you cover to collect uh, the solar energy so here's an example so let's suppose um uh you know let's suppose you want to charge an electric vehicle i've always wondered about this so it was great to do this example like you go out you buy a tesla and you want to charge it with solar panels it seems like a, a good idea so how many how many 400 watt solar panels the one we just looked at are needed to charge an ev located in longmont right for a daily commute of 25 miles each way uh that's that's my commute to my other office. Okay, so that's why I picked that. So that would be 50 miles a day. Um, and then let's just make it easy and say 50 miles each day on weekends for fun. So what's the physical area? How much of your roof, how much of your backyard do you have to uh, occupy with solar panels? And then what's the cost required for that? Okay, so let's take a, let's go buy a used Tesla Model 3 uh, and get the extended range model. Uh, so it has a, a lithium ion battery, right? Kind of like that battery I showed. Uh, it, it's energy. So hopefully you know from our discussion on batteries now and, and, and energy and power, you get a feel for 80.5 kilowatt hours. That's a unit of energy. And uh, the marketing material claims 310 miles. So let's, let's assume that's true. Let's figure out how much solar panel we need. The solar panels we're gonna use are these relatively modern 400 watt solar panels. Okay. And let's assume you park next to the panels during the day. So that was a problem in my model here. I think I have to go buy two Teslas. So I leave one at home, charge it, drive the other one to work, come home, charge the, charge the used Tesla, or figure, figure that out later. We'll figure that out later. But anyway, we, tr we park next to the panels during the day. How much energy is needed on each day? We'll use that to figure out how many panels are needed. So there's the battery capacity. And so that battery capacity is 80.5 kilowatt hours, which is interesting because, you know, you think about the kilowatt hour cost, right? We, we talk, I gave you a homework problem, and I know in Longmont energy costs about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So that's about, what's that? Um, 10 cents times 80, right? $8 of, of uh, energy in Longmont to, to charge that battery. And yeah, someone said, install the panels at the office. I would, that's a good idea. We're gonna need this many, we're gonna need this many um, panels for each person. So we'll figure that out too. Let's say there's 10 people who want to charge their car at work. So the maximum range um, uh, is 310 miles. So we can figure out the energy per mile. So we need about 0.26 kilowatt hours per mile, right? We're going from miles per gallon. We're used to talking about miles per gallon. You know that, you know, 15 is sort of bad and 30 is sort of good. We got to start talking now in kilowatt hours per mile when we talk about EVs. Okay, so 0.26 kilowatt hours per mile. Now, I don't want to like pull into my driveway and be empty right there. So I'm going to put a 10% margin on this just so practically to see, you know, I get home and I have 10% capacity left. So the est estimated energy per mile then is um, 0.286 kilowatt hours per mile, right, with that margin. Daily miles, uh, 50 miles per day. So the energy I need per day is 14.3 kilowatt hours. Okay, so that's what I need. Okay, so now to collect that, how do we figure out? Now, I know how much energy I need. I know 1,000 watts, peak sun. Um, how do I figure out how many panels? Well, there's the location. There's my energy required. So you can find lots of maps all over the internet. I went to NREL, the National Renewable National Renewable Energy Lab site, and pulled um, pulled some maps. 
so this is June. This is the this is the direct normal solar irradiance in June, right? This is the is where you get the most sun. And so what this is is if you you'll see the units are kilowatt hours per meter, um, kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. So it's really it's really energy, right? Energy per meter squared per day. Right? You got to keep track of these units here. And of course, in the Southwest where we get lots of sun, you see there's lots of availability, not so much as you get Northeast, but that's in June. And this is if you, this is per square meter. This is perpendicular. If you hold that, 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 um, you know, that area perpendicular to the sun. So this is direct normal irradiance. And so right in Colorado, I estimate, you know, somewhere around the max here, you know, where if you get up in the mountains, you're slightly less than 7.5. Here in the plains, you're about 7.5, maybe more. Let's use 7.5. But I also want to drive in December, right? So, so if you look in December, you get 4.2 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. That was interesting to see that, you know, it's a little, it's about, what, what's that, about 60%, something like that in uh, in December. Okay, so there's a metric called um, hours of peak sun. So solar installers will use this. So if you look at the units, kilowatt hours per meter squared per day, right, that's, that's what we get here in Longmont. And you look at the, 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 the peak sun um, power value, one kilowatt per meter squared, you can, you can get an equivalent peak sun hours value, which is 4.2 hours. That's why that one kilowatt per meter squared is convenient. So what this means is that instead of having like, you know, the sun rises in the morning, you get a little bit of sun and then at noon, you get lots of sun. And then as it goes over the mountains, it gets darker. Um, this, this 4.2 hours is like, if you had, if you could, if you could turn off the sun and you can go directly overhead, turn on the sun for 4.2 hours and then turn it off. You're taking that, that curve and you're making it a rectangle and you're integrating that curve and making it into a rectangle. Okay. So. So we get 4.2 hours of peak sun every day here in Longmont. Okay, so now I could say the power required is um, is energy over time. So I need 3.4 kilowatts from my solar panels. We have um, solar panel output power of 400 watts. So I need 3,400 watts divided by 400, 8.5 panels. So you can't buy 8.5 panels, right? So we need nine panels to meet that minimum. And so what I'm gonna use uh, uh, that extra half panel, I'm gonna call that margin. And in reality, I might, need, I might need some more margin because I used the direct normal solar radiance, which means I'm always pointing the panels toward the sun. That's not really a great assumption, but let's, let's just go with it for now. I might add a 20% margin later. Okay, so for nine panels, how much area do I need? I need three, let's say it's three by three uh, panels, 18 by 10. So 180 square feet, that's how many panels I need. Okay, and then what is the cost? So the cost now of installing a panel is about, um, about $3 per watt. So, so I need about, so, so bottom line is to get my, um, to get my energy to charge the car, I need uh, nine panels, cost about $11,000, and that will get me through December uh, driving 50 miles a day. Okay, so, so this is, this is kind of what you can do. Th this is a high energy example. If you had something like a, you know, again, a street sign or a gate or something, a product that, you, you know, you want to go deploy a remote sensor on top of Long's Peak and have it sit there for a while and transmit with a lot fewer watts than this. Um, you can use this approach. 
You can look at the maps, these um, irradiance maps. You can figure out what time of year uh, you, you want to do this. You want to deploy your system. You can estimate the, uh, the panels required. You can estimate your battery capacity needed. And you could build a totally self-contained, solar-powered, remote sensing system uh, using this approach. And then, of course, you got to design your system. But this will power your system. Okay, so you can use this for, you know, homes, RVs, remote sensing equipment, going off the grid, whatever. But this, this is this is a way to estimate that. Again, lots of assumptions, <clears throat> so you probably want to add margin here um, for, you know, dirt, snow, um, not tra not tracking the sun, etc. Okay. All right, so this finishes up my multi-day discussion on, on power sources. Um, there, so, you know, we didn't talk about AC sources, for example. Um, if you want some more information on, so a, a, AC sources, that's a whole different topic. When you're, when you're operating DC devices from AC sources like wall power, what you're usually doing is converting AC to DC and then all the DC stuff I talked about applies. Um, so if you want some information on converting AC to DC, take a look at the review videos. I talk about rectifiers. I talk about converting AC to DC with diodes. Um, they're switching power supplies. We're going to get a little bit into that later uh, when we talk about DC to DC converters. Um, but you still need to know rectifiers. So if you're interested in AC conversion to DC, take a look at the review videos on Canvas, and you can watch five minutes on that. Um, if you're interested on actually powering things with AC, uh, like industrial systems with three-phase power, that's a whole course in itself. So, but but if you look up electric power systems, you can get an idea of what split-phase power is, you know, for your house, what three-phase power is for for industry. And, um, you know, I wish we had enough time in this course to cover it, but unfortunately we don't. All right. Any questions on sources that you want to ask now before we move on to contro uh, controlling power to devices? Hey, nothing seen, nothing heard. So we'll. If you want to chat at office hours, come join. So let's talk about controlling power <clears throat> to devices. And so in my diagram of an electronic system, this is what I'm looking at. That one piece that controls you know, in the, uh, power to some kind of high current device. Okay. So there are uh, simple solutions like manually actuated devices like switches. So um, so this is a switch. Uh, you change the position mechanically as you know to connect or disconnect contact. Okay, so those are switches. And there are various configurations. So this is a boring single pole, single throw switch. Um, they get more elaborate than that. So they're toggle switches, rotary switches, um, we'll talk a little bit about those. There are electrically actuated power control devices. For example, you might have seen relays. So relays are um, essentially switches that are actuated by a magnetic field, and that magnetic field is caused by a current through a coil that, that you apply. So that's how that works. Uh, transistors are a truly electronic way to control power to a device. Uh, there's the bipolar junction transistor. Bipolar junction transistors, BJTs, um, are, are generally used to control, I'll say, a low to moderate amount of power, and maybe even I'll say low amount of power to, to a device. Um, BJTs are current control devices, right? and you apply a current IB to control IC. 
Um, and, and if you want to control a lot of current to a device, you need a lot of base current, right? If the, if the beta of that transistor is low and for power transistors, they're usually not that high. So I'm going to skip over BJTs for now. If you're interested in those for controlling like low power devices, again, take a look at the review videos that I posted. There's one there on BJTs and how they work and how to use them as a switch. But I'm more interested in controlling maybe higher current, like if you're using some kind of high current DC motor. And for that, I would use a field effect transistor like a MOSFET, a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor that you are using in, uh, in lab. So FETs, instead of current control devices like BJTs, they are voltage control devices. So FETs um, typically use this, this gate to source voltage like you're using in lab to control the drain current. Okay, someone asks on the chat, are circuit breakers technically a mix between a switch and a relay? Um, so, sort of, there are different kinds of breakers, just a typical, typical breaker. Often they are uh, uh, thermally controlled. If you get too much current, it just opens up the switch. So they're a, they're, they're a kind of a, a thermally activated switch. Some breakers like ground fault indicator, GFI breakers, actually actually sense the return current. They sense the current to the circuit and the current from the circuit. And if there's any difference, there's current going someplace else, like to ground, which it shouldn't go. Um, and it should go from you know the, the 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 live wire to the return, the feed to the return, and if you have a current leak somewhere to ground, they actually trip because of the imbalance in current. So there's different kinds of circuit breakers, but in general, circuit breakers have this switch feature, but they're actuated by by something like a, like a thermal response or an imbalance in current. Okay, oh, what what current do I can what current and voltage do I consider high current and high voltage? So um, bipolar junction transistors, I might use those for maybe an amp or less, maybe 10 amps or less. But once you get up to higher than 10 amps, I would start looking at FETs. In fact, 10 amps, I think, would be high for a, a BJT. Again, there are high power BJTs, but I would always go to a FET when I'm, I'm controlling uh, several amps. They're just easier to control because they take, they take in, in theory, no current. Um, but, but if I could, I could connect a microcontroller or controlling device to a MOSFET directly, or as a power transistor, I might need to have actually stages of transistors to get the current up high enough to cause this transistor to saturate. In voltage, you know, once you're, once you get above about 28 or 30 volts, a lot of chips, a lot of semiconductors that will, that will get outside of their um, range of, I'll, I'll say, low voltage. Um, so higher voltage, once you get over about 28 or 30 volts, I'd say that's, that's getting into a higher voltage range. Okay. That's all relative, by the way, right? It's people who work in high voltage all the time with high voltage circuits, that's probably low voltage to them. But I'm talking about working on a bench with a kind of a, you know, kind of the project we're working with now. So other, so there are other electrically actuated switching devices. You might've heard of solid state relays, um, opto isolator relays, thyristors, SCRs. I'm not gonna go into those, but once you know some basics here, I think you can understand how they work. Okay. Let's talk about switches. Switches are actually, they're actually, you know, don't diss the switch. They're actually um, used in some pretty complex systems without any electronically controlled devices. Excuse me, I'm just getting my voice back. So common switch types, it's worth talking about. You got the plain old toggle switch and sides, slide switch, right? 
You also have micro switches and limit switches. So, you know, up at the top, these are essentially a user interface. Turn something on manually. Micro switches, limit switches, those are usually detecting the presence of something like, like a lever or an arm or a wheel or something like that, right? There's some, maybe a, something on a cam, a lobe on a cam. So, so these are usually used in some kind of, I'll say automated system. Here's a rotary switch. Right, many positions. See those on the front panels of equipment. This is a dip switch. Dip is dual inline pin. Dual inline pin. So those are designed to be plugged into um, circuit boards. So there's actually eight switches here. Usually, those are meant for configuring um, configuring devices in hardware. Um, so talking about some terminology, which is useful to know, uh, latched versus momentary. So your wall switch, when you turn on the light in your house, that's a latch switch. You switch positions and the switch stays there versus a momentary switch. Um, you press the switch like a push button switch or this limit switch. You press on it and the switch opens or closes and then you will release it and the switch goes back to its original position. That's a momentary switch. There's terminology like normally open, normally closed. So here's a here's a switch that has two connections. You either connect to common to normally closed or common to normally open. So if this is a momentary switch, you don't touch it. This is the connection that you see normally closed. You press the switch and then common connects to normally open. And then there's the, the poles and throws. And so poles is the number of connection circuits. Throws are the number of output connections. So you can have single pole, single throw, single pole, double throw, double pole, double throw, four pole, single throw. So for example, this is a single pole, single pole, single pole, single throw switch. Okay, this is a single pole double throw switch. So it has one connection circuit, so it's a single pole, and it has two output connections. That makes a double throw. This is a double pole single throw switch. So when you, when you flip this switch, both of these connections are made or broken simultaneously. Okay, but there's only one output connection per um, pole, so that's a single, th single throw. Um, this is a double pole, double throw switch. And I'll tell you, I, I confuse myself and always have to go back to um, uh, looking at a diagram uh, to figure out which one I want. But this is terminology you'll see when you buy a switch. Other, other strange types of switches, uh, the four-way switch uh, that you might have in your house, uh, this, this light switch here. Um, and what this does is it either connects uh, like this or connects like this. So when you move the switch in your house, so if you, have a, if you have a light in your house, in your apartment, that is connected by three or more switches, not two or more, but three or more switches, then you have one of these. And so it does this. You want to connect power to a light and you want three switches independently controlled you can go to any one and turn the light on or off then you actually use two what are called three-way switches they're just single they're they're single pole double throw and then you use one of these four-way switches and so if you stare at this long enough you realize how you can walk up to any one of these switches and turn this light bulb on or off from any one of those switches and that's what that four-way switch does Okay. Okay. Um, so there are some pretty um, like complex systems you can make out of just of just switches. This is why I want to say it's there. There's um, there's a use here. Limit switches are to detect the presence um, or the position or the orientation of an object, right? And I think this is useful. In fact, someone in this class at one point had a question about this connecting a switch to a microcontroller or an 
even an A to D converter that's sensing a voltage. Um, so putting a, a, a switch in series with either a pull-up resistor or a pull-down resistor is very common. The, if, you want, if you want a microcontroller or a digital circuit to sense the position of a switch, open or closed, right? You typically do this. Uh, you, you connect a resistor between the port, between the device that's doing the sensing, uh, and either five volts or the, the power supply or ground. Okay, so what happens here is that in this condition, when the switch, when this limit switch is open, the microcontroller sees five volts. Microcontroller inputs, as we'll talk about, or even analog to digital converter inputs, we'll talk about, have very high input impedance. They have practically no current flowing into them. That means there's practically no current going through that resistor when this switch is open. Ohm's law says there's no voltage across that resistor, zero volts when there's no current. So when the switch is open, you see five volts. When the switch is closed, you directly connect that microcontroller port or whatever is sensing that voltage to ground. So the node voltage is zero volts. So this is an extremely common way to, um, to uh, uh, connect a switch to something that has to sense a digital voltage. We definitely don't want to leave, a, for example, a microcontroller input port or any sensing device just floating, just open, because who knows what the voltage is? Especially if it's high impedance, charge can actually collect on there because there's no place for the charge to go, static essentially. Um, can can collect on there and the voltage will vary. It can pick up uh, EM waves. It can pick up lots of different um, sources of voltage. So you always want, if you're sensing a voltage, it connected some to something reference to the system that's sensing. And this does that. You could, you could swap the pull up resistor, make it a pull down resistor, put the switch up top, and then you just invert what's happening. When the switch is um, open, you'll see zero volts. When the switch is closed, you'll see five volts. But anyway, Point is, this is a common configuration. So that's how you should use switches in digital systems. Um, there are some complex electrical, electromechanical systems that implement some pretty complex control entirely using mechanical switches and relays versus an electronic controller. And so one example is many landing gear systems and aircraft use just limit switches and, and relays. So this one particular system has, has a bunch of switches. There's uh, gear down switches that limit when the gear's down in this position. Um, there's a weight on wheel switch that tells you when the struts are extended, when the airplane's flying or when it's on the runway or on a taxiway. Uh, there are three throttle position switches. There's one motor arm up switch, which tells you when the gear's up, and there's one gear selection switch which the pilot controls, right? It says nine switches um, and no microcontroller, um, no electronic logic control going on here. And that controls uh, the landing gear motor, uh, uh, whether it's on or off and what direction it runs. It controls uh, indicator lights to tell the pilot when the gear's up, the gear's in transition or the gear's down. There's a warning horn in there. So if you, if you, pull the throttles all the way back um, and the plane, the plane thinks you're, you're intending to land. And if the gear's up, it, it um, sounds a warning horn. And there's actually a connection to the heater system. So you don't um, have zero airflow through a combustion heater. So these are the limit switches that you'll see in sort of an industrial or an aerospace or a, you know, more of a, a rugged environment that, that sense position of linkages. Um, on a system like this, okay, and and just to show you how 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 these can get complex, right? Here's the here's the landing gear motor which has to turn two different directions. Here's the relay that controls that motor, right? Here here are indicators: the light, the gear horn, the indicator lights, and here are all those switches. Right, the weight on wheels switch, sometimes called a squat switch, a limit switch on the gear, right? You can see how many. Um, poles and throws and how they're connected. Uh, throttle switches, single pole, single throw. Here's a here's a switch here. 
double pull, double throw. And look at this one. This is, yeah, uh, complex, right? So, but again, you can have pretty complex systems. You'll see in industry, in aircraft, and maybe even some vehicles that uh, rely entirely on switches and uh, not uh, not logic gates, not microcontroller software. So, don't diss the switch. All right. So it looks like I have hit. The wall on time here. So I am going to end it here and continue with office hours. But just be sure to, to check uh, uh, Canvas for the due times and the due dates of the upcoming assignments. I think your next homework assignments due next week. Um, I will post the exam solutions soon once I confirm that I've received all the exams and they're all submitted. I'll start office hours right after class. So if you'd like to join, I'd love to have you. If not, I will see you next time. Have a great night.